in New Hampshire, in the United States. Uh, so glad to see everyone. I especially welcome our distinguished uh, author, uh, uh, Professor Abimbola Adelakon. Uh, congratulations and uh, welcome to this panel. It's a real pleasure and a privilege for for me and I think for all of us to be a part of uh, the celebration of this book that uh, uh, just came out. So this is uh, great. Uh, so, uh, well, without um, uh, taking too much time, uh, there were, uh, we had some confusions over the time. Uh, I was also initially confused. I had to go and check earlier to make sure that uh, uh, we are we understand that we are all following the Nigerian time, which I think is reasonable time to follow because we have people from everywhere, and the conference is taking place in Lagos, so that is good. So I we just introduce us briefly. I uh, we some of us we know each other. Some of us we are meeting for the first time. And uh, so you will uh, just crave my indulgence because I didn't receive um, a bio from everybody. I received from all uh, most. So I will just say that maybe what we should do to make it faster is that we should uh, each of us should introduce ourselves. Uh, I know most of us, but some of us don't. So I've started with myself. Just tell us your name, uh, what you, where you are, where you are based, if you are attached to a university, an independent scholar. Um, you can inform us if you want us to also know. Tell us about your book, if you have published any. That would be great. So please, yeah. let's do that. I started it. Uh, uh, Professor... Uh, maybe Professor Adia Co can start for us. <laughs> yes. I'm from the University of Lagos. Uh, my name is Adeleke Adia Co. I teach at the Ohio State University in Columbus in the English Department and African American and African Studies. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, uh, Professor Moya. Actually, I'm not a professor. Thank okay. you very much. I'm Xavier Moye, and uh, I log in from Ibadan right now, so from okay. Nigeria, but I see a colleague logged in uh, from Italy, and uh, I'm an anthropologist, so I've got a, a, an academic background, but uh, at the moment I work as a consultant here. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, uh, we have, uh, uh, anyway, I will say, Dr. Sinolu, now, Professor. Don't, you, don't, you don't need to worry. Just go ahead, please. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon in Lagos and good day everywhere else. My name is Ade Damala Oshinulu. I am a uh, a clinical associate at uh, New York University, where I teach in the liberal studies school. Um, I also work like Dr. Adelako, I work in, uh, on Pentecostalism in Nigeria. So I look at how Pentecostals think about space. Uh, my background, my PhD is in culture and performance. Um, okay. Seeing you today from London, where I am organizing a faculty symposium. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you and welcome. Thank now you. we have uh, Dr. Dunwoyi. Um, it is good evening from my end. I teach in the Religious Studies Department in Gozanga University, Spokane in Washington State. Okay. Presently, I am in Florence, Italy for the Study Abroad Program. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so I am the one who got thrown 
off by the timing and I kept bothering everyone. Thank you for for the rescue. Um, I also work in Pentecostalism, but mostly focused on the gender dynamics. And thankfully, my first work will be out in August of this year and published by Braille. It is titled Crash Realities, Gender Dynamics in Nigerian Pentecostalism. So very good. Thank you and welcome. Thank you for uh, alerting us. We will not. We, we will have missed you on the panel. It's still better for you to send the email. Uh, I was actually going to send an email like fifteen minutes, but that would not have been fast enough. Uh, reminder. But um, well, so this is uh, good. We are going to. Um, I sent an a, a, an email out earlier indicating that I want us to speak for 10, 10 minutes. But um, after that, I got and we got another email from the organizers saying that people, each panelist, you speak for 12 minutes. So I think they just sent that to everybody. But mine was already out before their own came. So we will give ourselves uh, 12, 12 minutes to... Um, a comment on the book to tell uh, us and to react to the book, to respond to the book. Uh, this is, um, I mean, when I, the first time I saw the book, the, the, the thing that attracted me, obviously, immediately was the title, you know, Powerful Devices, you know, and um, the, the way in which the author, and of course, the practitioners, the focus of the study, the people, the way they deployed the instrumentality of prayer into a very powerful force, force of change, not just at the personal, private, but even at the social, societal, and national level. And I was very intrigued by the connections uh, between the Nigerian Pentecostalism, which, uh, of course, the Connection is not new. It's always been there. Uh, Pentecostalism in Nigeria derived a lot of inspiration uh, from the United States uh, from right from the beginning. And um, but it became more acute, especially during the COVID era. You know, the COVID era was not supposed to be a period of serious academic productivity, but it became a very productive move, uh, uh, movement uh, for our scholar here, uh, uh, Dr. Adilakun. Uh, instead of um, uh, worrying and uh, trying to get restricted and uh, secluded, it, it became an opportune movement, you know, to capture something that is going to be very historic. We don't get this kind of time, maybe once in 100 years. The last epidemic was uh, in. Uh, the flu of 1918. So another one may not come until 2118 or something or something like that. So, but the way she was able to capture that movement uh, and deploy it and use it uh, to record something of major historical value, uh, you you don't you can't have this kind of opportunity again. It's it just came. It's kind of it was like a fleeting opportunity. But she used it to a very effective, significant uh, effect, and uh, at, at giving us this uh, exploration and this uh, perspective of uh, Pentecostalism in Nigeria and a particular aspect of it. So I was intrigued by that. I was also intrigued by the focus on um, uh, the mountain of fire. That is uh, the uh, uh, Doctor Olukoya. Um, you don't, when, I mean, it's of course it's a big name in Nigeria now. There's no, no, I mean, it has been a big name for some years. But naturally, when people talk uh, about the Pentecostalism, it's the big names you always hear. You hear the Adeboyes, the Kumuyis, and you hear the Oyedepos. Those are the big uh, names. Uh, and then you have Olukoya there. Because of this unique aspect, this prayer dimension, that the the way the the Olukoya people 
seized on the subject of prayer, which no all every one of, of the groups they have access to this instrumentality. But the Ulukoya, in a sense, they made it their own and um, developed it in a very distinct way. And I think this was what captured our author's uh, interest. And seems, and I think she has uh, produced a fascinating work from there. So let's, uh, without uh, me uh, saying too much, uh, I will go to the panelists and I will simply follow the order in which we have here. Um, uh, we will start with um, uh, Professor Diaco, and then we, we follow with Idunwoyi, uh, 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 Moya, and then we have Fusino. Do we have Uluwase here? Yes. Oh, okay. It's in attendance. Okay. Very good. Okay. I didn't ask. Did I ask for introduction? Where is Uluwase? He's here. He's not he's in the Oh, okay. Can you please? In, uh, if you are available, just introduce yourself briefly. We can't hear. I think you are muted. I am no, you are muted. Okay, you very from, good. From okay. Lagos State University, I teach philosophy. Uh, my current research works revolve around identity politics. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the oversight. I I was looking for a Zoom window without thinking that you are with the original crew in, in Nigeria. Okay, sorry about that. I apologize. Okay, so let's start with um, uh, uh, Professor Diaco. Uh, thank you, Professor Falaya. <laughs> to the author, Dr. Adilak, last night. So the version I'm reading is not just because I would like for her to respond uh, with some information regarding being a uh, reform with informed background uh, on what I, when she speaks back to what I'm saying. Let me start by saying that when can you hear me? Yeah, the the volume is not um, is not coming through clearly. Uh -oh. There's a lot of um, hiccup. Uh oh. I don't. Know. <laughs> Maybe there's a lot of inter. Yeah, there is a uh, there's a panel. I I just sent to you. Okay. is a believer's study, that this book is a believer's study of one, material practices and techniques, and two, goals and prayers, goals of prayers in selected and as only the North American iterations of these churches. I would like to know uh, Dr. Adelako's response to my calling her presentation her research as being from a believer's perspective, from a believer's perspective. Two, the studies appears to have been instigated by the striking similarities uh, that the author observed between the ordinarily incompatible domains of mental priorities and leftist political praxis, or the, there are two two things, two in, ordinarily incompatible things, at least on the Nigerian scene. On one hand, the polit political praxis of the left, and now we have evangelical prayer motions. Evangelicals like, like leftist ideologues cast the prevailing capitalist order into perdition because it is, it is believed to be irremediably unjust. 
all causes that threaten their potential for social flourishing, end of quote. There is one major difference though. Evangelicals believe that justness could be restored by prayer. Prayer warriors seek to, uh, uh, the, uh, this prayer performed as successfully choreographed that many on the political left expect to be the culmination of class antagonism. That the book speaks of prayer as a political praxis successfully is not in doubt. The book speaks of prayer as the way it is practiced among Nigerian evangelicals as a political practice. I shall add as well that Adilaku proves this argument beyond question. Implied but not argued is that is not unlike prayers. It's on one hand to, to say that uh, she's Adilaku says uh, political leftist political praxis is like is like uh, is like evangelicals. The book is also saying that leftist political praxis themselves are not too different. So it's both ways, and not just one way. The central focus of the detailed close reading is on performance across media, stage drama, story arc, ARC, stage props, dialogue, characters, actions, music, oratory, film, radio, television, not, but none of them studied equally. They are not given equal attention. But these are things mentioned. The best craft out of the performances, of the prayer performances, are such that they can move across media and mode easily. I, found, I want to quote here a statement I got in the newspaper last week. I found striking when he was asked about this, uh, uh, at an interview, why do you think stage drama has declined? As if he, I don't think he has read Adelako, but he was echoing Adelako in his response. He says there are many, there are many three reasons. But he says that it, the no less spectacular rise of the Pentecostal Christian movement, which has incorporated drama into its worship processes, and made secular commercial drama redundant, if not even sinful. According to the Pentecostal drama has actually been secular drama sinful in the way the, the, the way they become very good at it. This establishing establishment forces drives how events are patterned into stories as other as well as other performance features. Forms assumed by prayer as device include that that the, the device as prayer and prayer as device, both of them informing one another include the, the person of the pastor, the person of the praying individual, the form of words put to work, prayer, revelation stories, the technologies used, printing press, digital, and other reproducibility technologies like printed books, periodicals, and manuals, voice and video recorders. And I said Mo Mawara, spe specifically from Yoruba ways of translating a TV that they're actually capturing voice and image that evangelical practice is actually more more in the way he didn't I did like we didn't use that word. That's what I that's what I got from the way she was describing them. They wanted to capture the essence of speech and also the essence of appearance in one performance at, at the same time. So in that sense, we call it televisual. That's a tele televisual uh, in, in 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 the sense. Of course. It also includes the prayer city. So of all these devices, reproducibility is the common denominator. I should note that, if only to raise a talking point during Q and A, that the devices of managing time and space, time and space, ordinarily they attenuate, they reduce effect. So I'm the way I read Adelaku is that the performances of the evangelicals wanted to reduce that attenuative effect of space and time in the way they capture 
image and voice as one and the same and producing an effect. Uh, these are material devices and all these devices, many of them are agnostic in relation to evangelical belief systems. They have nothing to do with believing God and God and God, but they put it to use. Uh, the mater the, they are material devices. The body of the pastor and other participants included are deployed by the self-same bodies for dislodging establishment forces. Prayer warriors, in essence, are not are not a medium, as this is as this is traditionally understood. They think of themselves as being at one with their weapons, including imagined battle axes. That's the image that that's the the part of the book that caught me, that actually arrested me. That they they don't see themselves as using battle axes. They themselves are actually battle axes in the way they pray. And I wonder what's going on here. Again, I want us to I want I want to urge us to note the implication of this radical metaphysics, as it were, one in which language and other symbioses are not mediations created to make something happen, but are themselves presences that happen in the way they think of it. One in which figuration is deemed to have been abolished and painless literalism has been installed to replace it. A metaphysics that proceeds as if it has foreclosed time-space differences of here and there, of now and then. The question of this methodological dimension of the book lead me to ponder are related to ordinary language meaning of devices. Prayers are self-justifying and self self they could be found, they could be discovered through revelation, they could be invented, they could be made, they could be manufactured, and they could be distributed. They could be thought of as process or methodology which includes its own prescribed rituals and play at the same time. They combine both the sense of appearance and reality. In the process of detailing various kinds of performances named together as repertoire, I did like we use that word repertoire to describe of, uh, the, 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 the technology de 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 deployed. The book broaches what we call the phenomenology of evangelical prayers. We have a philosopher here who help us or, or perhaps answer that. That it, what I'm saying is that the book describes the character of the thing in itself that the prayer warriors believe that they are making. In doing this, the book follows two tracks. In one track, practitioners are allowed to speak and their words are quoted without judgment. Two, the, two character, the two principal characters in that regard are scientists. Dr. Uh, Ulukoya, the leader of Mountain of Fire, who is a microbiologist, and Dr. Emmanuel, a Cameroonian body by the train uh, MD, who works uh, from out of Houston in Texas. In the other track, the theological writing of Mimi Wariboko on West African evangelical, evangelicalism is the departure point. For this element of the book, what I have called the believer's perspective is most apparent as Adela Kuhn strives admirably to present the Pentecostalist consciousness as the, Pente as the Pentecostalist professes it. This is the first such academic account I have read. I am not a theologist, but that's the first account of that kind of, of presenting the consciousness of, of the evangelicals in that way. An, alternative, an attentive reader sees that Olukoya is a demonologist, demonologist, and a microbiologist as well. And the book allows both characters to speak about their coexistence. To paraphrase the late uh, Ranajit Guha, the Aki theories of subaltern studies in India, Adilako allows spiritual warriors to speak in their own chiliastic terms without imposing the pros of academic counterinsurgency. We must remember that warriors are Christians and Boko Haram were not. And I'm running, I'm getting closer to the end now. As much as this is the strength of the book, it is also its most significant weakness something that derives from the idea of ethical research that the author adopts. There is little uh, critical analysis of Dr. Emmanuel, President Trump, and their followers. 
uh, I will leave Trump's um, brand of racism in yeah. a second. Trump come, uh, racism yeah. comes up. Two, racism two minutes. Comes up, all right, I, I'll do a bit more, less than that. Racism comes up in the book, in one paragraph about Trump, and the rest in the notes and bibliography, not in the context of Trumpism. The book's revelations of triumphant literalism of prayer warriors is mind and eye opening for readers. But to my critical mind, a little more probing is perhaps needed, given that these warriors seem enthralled by idioms of scientism. I would have loved to have Unukoya speak about differences between physical forces and spiritual forces, whether it is more desirable to allow established civil engineering codes or pray against those forces of gravity to which shabbily constructed buildings, including the households of God, often succumb. Is gravity an established force? Is it evil? Are prayers experiments for manipulating existence? Does locating the source of self-fashioning outside the self work? If I have not sounded skeptical of the claims prayer warriors make about themselves, let me declare my conclusion that Adelaco's book is a powerful description of the iteration of the old will to power or desire to power or ifeku fiagbara in Yoruba. This expression of the will to power encountered in the book is the kind that bears no responsibility to any other in that it leaves no room for validation or testing. I ask, as a last, so that I'm not I'm mis misunderstood, I do not mean to say that praying or religious belief is false ideology. I'm not saying that, and Adelako did not say that. I do not believe it's, it is a lie to say that Adelako will agree me, with me on that because it, she did not say that prayer is a false ideology. I'm not accusing her of that. Mm -hmm. I ask as a last sentence in this in this uh, present, what does the fighting prayer make present? Let me repeat that. What does the fighting prayer make present? It, I answer that question for myself. I say that the only thing a fighting prayer can verifiably and assuredly make present is the prayer. Okay. I think we should stop there. <laughs> okay. with it? Thank you. Thank you. So welcome. I uh we will take uh, the others and then I as I believe that uh, Dr. Adelakmo is already noting down points to respond to. So she will respond to all of them at the end. So we have uh, uh Dr. Iduwonyi now. Thank you so very much, um, the LSA team and to Dr. Adela Kuhn for giving us an excuse to gather here and inviting me to participate um, in this round table. It is a beautiful and masterful account of the powerful devices and giving me an opportunity to truly think with you in radical ways and to do so collaboratively in community with these wonderful scholars. I guess I'm riding on the shoulder of the elder that spoke first and assembled in this virtual space. So I will start by offering my reflections and then engage the community. Um, my reflection is a test that calls attention to prayer and the political process of Pentecostal spiritual warfare. I thought I should time myself, all right. And provide an exceptional view of real and imagined realities and potential futures of not just the localized Nigerian Pentecostalism, but within the transnational landscape. Adelaku employs a detailed study of oral interviews, performative media, ethnography, and other sources to privilege the lived realities of Nigerian Pentecostals, often marginalized, and fold and fold them with links into a transnational discourse within the field of contemporary media technology. For in calling attention to all, we call attention to ourselves. It is to rediscover the indigeneity associated with Nigerian Pentecostalism. 
and in discovering it in Nigeria Pentecostality, Pentecostalism, we discover it in all of us. The conceptual world of Nigerian Pentecostalism, the consciousness, the questions, and the practices yields in lived realities made me reflect upon our shared religious histories. I am reminded that powerful devices uses a performative studies lens to situate the future of Nigeria Pentecostalism within African religions. I am reminded that performative prayer practice is imbricated in our daily lived experiences that are encapsulated in fake science, socioeconomic, and political circumstances. I am reminded of the value of considering Nigeria Pentecostalism as multi-layered with all of life assets. It is fascinating how powerful devices challenge the unidirectional religious practices familiar among monocultural, monolingual scholars by primarily focusing on the performative prayer practice that Pentecostals is not static or pure. It is not separate from the social, economic, and political arenas. Adela Kuhn reminds us that performance studies implicate Pentecostalism with neoliberalism and capitalism as a transformative device. This is where we see the powerful, incisive, dramatic, philosophical imaginations and interventions that powerful devices make for us. It challenges scholars who are critical of Pentecostal volatility and continue to describe Nigerian Pentecostalism as counterfeit, crude, and rapacious. Adela Kuhn interprets Pentecostalism as spirit moves, not confined to private or unidirectional flows from, unauthor from authorized people and hegemonic centers. This work we probably shape the performative and Pentecostal studies feeds for years to come. I recommend the introduction and chapters three and four for their insight into transnational lived realities, the tensions between churches and church and state relations, the impressive details that justifies this imagination develops in the book's four chapters. She demonstrates how Pentecostal pastors employ the symbols of power to exploit their followers. In my reflection, opening it with a vivid description of senior pastor Joshua Talana of the Shepherd's House International being seated in a plastic chair, suspended by cis men who move him around in the altar in a telling way is intentional and points to symbol of power. She argues convincingly that careful scholarly engagement with participant observation and local knowledge contribute significantly to her methodological practice and reflection. Intersectionality shapes Adela Kuhn's work and readers' understanding of transnational realities. She sets out the book's roadmap and the variegated contestations that are further engaged throughout the book. Um, she points out that Pentecostals are in continuous, constant war zones and power contests with invisible forces who intend to create a miscarriage of pregnancies. She showcases Dr. Daniel Olukoya, a scientist turned pastor and founder of the Obsessed with the Demon's Mountain of Fire Ministry, whose flair for imploring dangerous and violent prayers as apocalyptic device have transcended cultural barriers to emerge in North America. She cleverly shows how Olukoya's word is imbricated in African cosmologies, where borrowing mythic narratives and metaphors are normalized to find backup in scientific rationalization. This obsession with twatting negative futurity opens them to the forces of capitalism and neoliberalism. Going further, um, she writes on the shoulder of an acclaimed philosopher and ethicist, 
the Pentecostal scholar Nimi Wariboko, to split God's mystic into smaller and more manageable fragments in ways that can weaponize and hold any part of the bodies in the directions of social spiritual situations that need urgent attention. God is militant, as are the prayer warriors daily in life battles. They become weapons in the hands of God. They take their destructive abilities directly from God and come with a sense of urgency. They have been engrafted in God's body and army with Ruth Marshall's, what Ruth Marshall calls militant Christians. So in Nigerian Pentecostalism, God is volatile and vibrantly alive. Unlike the whole God that academics pronounced there in the 90s, she makes an excellent comeback to how the dead God re-emerged in the 90s among Pentecostals, which many still think is rapacious. We also go further to see how um, in um, Nigeria and the United Adelakun transverse countries and disciplines, Nigeria and the United States, medical doctors and scientists turn spiritual warriors position themselves as heroes of mentality with the ability to be seers of hidden truth whose voices must be heard in the public and worldly arena she shows how demons map themselves into material world through government and institutions of power citing the example of the diabolical prediction made by the scientific elite over Africa during the pandemic. Spiritual warriors consider themselves as God's battle acts and spiritual agents with authority to engage in a spiritual war and determine how things unfold in the real world. For them, the diabolical discernment over Africa was beyond political economic cosmologies. It was spiritual and must be addressed in the spiritual contact war zone. Warriors assume their agency as their belief in, in, is integral to their understanding and relations with powerful forces are larger than human and there's always more to reality than the physical eyes can see. We go further to see how she features the church and state in relationship with the church and the church in relationship with itself during the pandemic and strategies churches adopt to thrive at such challenging times. Um, she carefully, I missed something, I need to scroll back down, give me a minute. Um, she picks up typical themes of ethnographic scholarship of tensions among the churches. For instance, she is keen to present a nuanced pastor's understanding of the state's role in church affairs during the COVID. The cosmologies and religiosities of each pastor frame the attentions. Continuous negotiation of state and church power and yep. knowledge. Two minutes. All right. So while celebrating the richness of details presented in powerful devices, perhaps some details requires more explanation. For example, Adela Kun did not show her audience the extent to which she is an outsider a practitioner or an outsider and academics in these spiritual world spaces. This should be, there should be a further explanation of what Jerry Springler's TV show is. How is this connected with the spiritual warfare? How do you think your audience know what the Springler's TV is all about in relation to the spiritual warfare that is the focus of this book? What can be done to obtain the symbolism of power that these pastors wield around themselves as warlords? Is it right for the subalterns, in this case, the cis men that carry Pastor Telana, to continue on this path? How can the adherent be taught another way of knowing? Adela Kun did not position herself in this argument. What would you be your position? You have left your audience to figure this out. The symbol that Pastor Telana has built is mostly right. Is it morally right? What is the real aspiration of the subaltern? To win spiritual wars and be worldly oppressed, Adela Kun should point her audience in this direction. 
The transnational flow of Pentecostalism resembles what Peggy Levitt refers to as religious assemblages. Levitt derives this idea from philosophical theories predicted on the image of rhizome. In botany, a rhizome is a plant whose nodes or extension behave as roots, allowing for extensive literal growth. As a philosophical idea, it represents non hierarchical entities that afford multiple entries, affiliations, and offshoots into the definitive origin or singular root. Let me borrow this idea to convey religious affiliation that entail contingent and clustering. They continue to unsettle boundaries. Pentecostalism in Nigeria's most significant difficulty is honoring its homogeneity and heterogeneity. There is a great deal of diversity in the various expression of Pentecostalism. Scholars divide the reception and development of modern Pentecostalism into three phases. It is hard to situate these Pentecostals since homogenizing Pentecostals is, pen is problematic. In contrast, Adela Kuhn, in the interrogation of the Pentecostal churches she studied, brings on board a diverse range of Pentecostal churches and read them as if they are homogeneous. This approach is problematic and skeptical when they are treated as one entity. A word of okay. caution is that generalizing okay. is an aberration. Quickly, with the tension in the ranks, it is not clear who has the authority to frame the direction of the future Pentecostal narrative. Will there, be, will there continue to be tension among these spiritual warriors? Ruth Macha describes this in her study as political spirituality. Um, Adela Kun should also point her audience to this direction. Thank you. Okay. Thank you uh, for that uh, intervention. So we will uh, move on now to our next speaker. Okay. Uh, that will be uh, Moyat. Yes. That's right. So that's why I will give you some extra time because my own intervention may be shorter than the one of my colleague. I prepared okay. for 10 minutes. So okay. uh, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Aderinto for this invitation to participate into the panel. Without his dynamic leadership, there would be no Lego Studies Association. May his career continue to blossom. Thanks also to Dr. Williams from the Commonwealth Institute of London. She has recently authored a remarkable book about Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana Patrice Lumumba of Congo and the role of the Central Intelligence Agency, AKI, the CIA. So the role of this agency in the neocolonization of Africa. Thank you, Dr. Susan, to be among us. Of course, thanks to the writer of the book we are here to discuss, Dr. Adela Kuhn. We are grateful to your scholarship Thanks to it, we are united this afternoon to share intellectual time. Special greetings to Dr. Osinolu. We met some years ago during another conference of LSA in New York. Uh, before the panel, I saw some pictures taken there. So it is nice to be here with you on the same virtual panel. I also want to acknowledge the presence of Professor Adeboye, and uh, Dr. Kuetze in the public. Uh, maybe there are other people. Um, if I forget any name, please bear with me. So estimated colleagues, distinguished Professor Adeko, Dr. Afolayan, Dr. Edomuyi, Dr. Oyekan, learned public. The reading of this book was particularly interesting for me as it contains special references to public health, power, and media, three domains I studied in the past in relation with Pentecostal churches in Nigeria. As a result, I was very glad to accept the invitation of Said. 
I would like first to state that this work is most welcome because it is written from the point of view of somebody empathetic to the spiritual warriors. The simple fact that the author could benefit from the support of MFM leader, Dr. Olukoya, deserves an accolade. May not be an easy person to approach. So, as a Nigerian, Dr. Adela Kun understands very well the worldview developed by spiritual warriors. This changes from the implicitly hostile view developed by Catholics or atheist researchers in the study of this of the Pentecostal studies. Also, the fact he treats an object fairly provides in the end a good study, very thorough and thoughtful. Second point in her book, she articulates the action of evangelicals in the US with the specific input of Nigerians. This is most welcome since so much has been written about the adverse role of Black Lives Matter on Trump partisan camp. The book depicts minutely an episode around the intervention of Dr. Stella Emanuel. Already, the capital, religion, and politics are involved. Also, thirdly, this book underscores the role of social media. It is another positive aspect, and it allows a different relation of the observer to the fieldwork. A virtual access totally justified by the lockdowns, more significantly, studying the social media becomes urgent since the digital dimension is everywhere. This ubiquity is illustrated by our very virtual meeting here and there. Finally and fourthly, the theoretical approach is really innovative. It is good to use the performative lens to envisage political praxis of prayer. Thus, a careful consideration of the ritual and its organization is allowed. Here, we discover the religious phenomenon not only through the ideas or the practices, but through the dynamic stage of performance. This approach is very productive. Now, I would like to raise some few questions. I am not totally convinced by the demonstration of the author as regards the de-establishment of oppressive forces. The author sees the prayer as radical, but some commenters, like maybe Prof. Adeko before, uh, some commenters would certainly take issues with this stand. They may believe that the worldview brought about by spiritual warriors is not liberating, but rather alienating. Even if the practice of violent prayer might be seen as rebellious to the hegemony, it is possible to believe it is vain in the long run. Some would even say that spiritual warriors developed an imaginary universe of demons and fights to the detriment of a real engagement with socio-political forces, hence favoring a kind of status quo. To be provocative, one can wonder what has the Pentecostal movement achieved in terms of improvement of the Nigerian situation since the renewal occurring in the University of Ibadan, all documented long time ago by Professor Matthews Ojo. About nationalism, I am not sure either that the global ambition of Christianity is really supranational, even if it taps into the Bible and precisely the Great Commission command. It can be argued that the US, a single and powerful nation, constitutes the real power behind the Pentecostal explosion. For instance, the Christ for the Nations Institute in Texas formed the Archbishop Benson Idausa in the 70s. And you all know his name 
he was instrumental in the dissemination of Pentecostal and charismatic churches, not only in Niger, but all over West Africa. On another note, the expression arithmetic of the disease used about the COVID-19 virus is problematic to me. It seems to endorse the view held, for instance, by the compromised political leadership of UK, that the figures used were real facts, objective data, whereas, as we all know, all scientific facts are also socially constructed. In conclusion, this book is outstanding. The space is not sufficient here to describe all its positive facets. One side that I did not discuss is its deep reflection about the dynamics of vision and the ability to see. Also, the monography shows how concretely the dialectic between science and spirituality works within the context of Wow, conspirituality. I hope that. Okay, well, uh huh. So, I hope that um, this work will pave the way for more studies into this critical and fascinating area of research concerned by secrecy and knowledge. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Moyat, for uh, that um, uh, presentation and reading of the book. Uh, we we uh, move on to uh, Dr. Osinolu, Osinolu uh, Ade Damola. Thank you very much, Professor Afalayo, and thank you, Professor Adela Kun, for having me on the panel and to the Professor Derento for inviting me in the first place. I do have to let you know that uh, my presentation is going to be somewhat informal. I had competing obligations this week, so my comments are, are not prepared, rather sort of remarks, um, having read the text. So I hope you will bear with me and uh, uh, forgive me for that. Um, I think... Uh, That's okay. First, Congratulations on uh, on releasing this book in hot pursuit of your previous monograph. Um, I think it's a very timely and important intervention for, amongst other things, coming from a performance studies um, approach to the study of Nigerian and African Pentecostalism. I saw, uh, I, I thought that one of the things that was really successful was reframing the relationship between the so-called global north and the global south by showing the ways in which Nigerian Pentecostals put themselves at the center of the sacred geography of Pentecostalism. And that we now see then the impact of that positionality in the world, right? What's more illustrated, illustrated of that than the impact of Nigerian Pentecostalism on American politics in the person of uh, the people who were supporting uh, Donald Trump and um, the conversations around COVID, including by um, Stella Emanuel. Um, what was really successful for me in the book was the way that you give us several heuristics with which to understand Pentecostalism, to understand the Pentecostal worldview. And perhaps this ties into uh, Professor Adeko's point about whether this is from the believer's um, perspective. Um, I thought the, uh, the, your, your definition of the apocalyptic device was absolutely essential. I want to read it very briefly, right? Prayer as apocalyptic devices, the portal through which the doors of the imagination open to let in a transcendent reality and allow spiritual warriors to control how time functions in their lives by disestablishing present social and political formations that threaten the social progress. I think what is really fascinating about Dr. Lukoya's 
treatises and his sermons and the way he engages with his congregation is his demand that they deploy their imagination and that they deploy their imagination spatially by, by, through corporeality. What I mean by that is that the, the, the performative actions, the prayers, the gestures, the pronounced, the locu elocutionary pronouncements, die, die, you know, yeah, and so on, uh, require you to um, enter into a kind of imaginary, one in which the physical and the invisible are actually inseparable. And so by physically acting, by acting corporeally in the physical world, you can shape what's happening in the invisible or the imaginary world and vice versa. What's happening, the dreams you have, for instance, shape what's happening in your physical world, what's happening to your actual body. What's unique about what you've done is you've actually given us another special dimension, which is the virtual. Because in addition to the invisible and the physical, you've actually conducted this research virtually, which makes me ask all kinds of questions. You know, if embodiment is so important for this, um, this particular, you know, as you say, gestural uh, uh, forms of practice, how does that how does that translate into the into the virtual world? I think TB Joshua has been on that track all along, as you point out in your other chapter. You know, when you watch TB Joshua's uh, the, the his manual TV, a lot of the healing, as you point out, happens through the screen, right? Which is why he has this global audience. And so what's happened, I think, is there's a way in which COVID accelerated the penetration of the virtual um, the virtual uh, space by the Pentecostals in a way that they were probing before, but they really kind of dive into it. So I really appreciate that about your intervention. Um, I, I was um, wondering um, about a few things. One is which, fascinates me as well is the relationship between Dr. Lukoya's training as a microbiologist and as a scientist and his pronouncements, this decidedly on scientific pronouncements he makes in his treatises. And it's always been a struggle how to reconcile that. But for him, it doesn't seem like there's a contradiction. So I wonder if you could help us untangle why there isn't a contradiction for him. And in your text, you mentioned the enlightenment and perhaps the way I want to phrase the question is, what is the place of the enlightenment in African intellectual life? By which I mean, is this, is the enlightenment part of our patrimony, if you will? Um, if it is, how do we, put it in, in, into conversation with the rest of our cultural, uh, our intellectual patrimony. Um, are there limits to their compatibility? And what I mean by that is, uh, it's all well and good, and I've argued this to my students sometimes, it's all, all well and good to recognize that the intellectual processes that Olukoya as a scientist deploys and the intellectual processes he deploys as a preacher are actually the same. He's creating taxonomies, right? In one case, he's creating scientific taxonomies. In another, he's creating spiritual taxonomies. But we reach the limits of that when it comes to COVID because all of, all of a sudden here comes Stella Emmanuel and she's saying things that are decidedly unscientific and problematic. And it seems as if Olukoya himself arrives at that conclusion that, hold up, I'm going to shut down prayer, prayer city because... Science has a place here, as you point out in your text. The, uh, the last question, or maybe the last couple of questions I want to leave you with is um, the violence. What is the root of the violence in the discourse? In other words, okay, we're deploying militant uh, martial themes, we're deploying very unchristian, if you will, violent kind of language, where is that coming from? Does it have anything to do with the 
politic the, the politics of the nation? Does it have to do with the urbanism of the city? I, I wonder if you could just elaborate on that a little bit. And then I wonder if you could probe further. I know you talk about this, but I wonder if you could probe further the sweetness of praying in the indigenous tongue. Because for me, understanding Olukoya's methodology requires understanding the Aladura movement. You know, it, 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 it doesn't start in, in the 80s when the narrative of Pentecostalism, you know, it re you really can really just uh, really understand understand um, what's going on. You know, when people are saying that the, the prayer is sweeter in Yoruba, there's a reason, as you, as you point out in your text, and I just wonder if you could elaborate a bit further on that. Uh, and with that, I'll turn the microphone back to Professor Afolayan. And again, I apologize that my remarks were not prepared, or were not written and read. Oh, that, that's okay. Uh, thank you so much. You know, it's, uh, we have been talking about vehicles and instruments. So there are many ways you can deploy your, your message. So uh, it is okay. Uh, I think you have made some very um, important points that I'm sure the author will respond to. Uh, so we have um, last but not the least, um, uh, Dr. Adeolu Oyeka. I apologize again for my earlier oversight. So you are please welcome. Is you have the floor now. Uh, let me join um, um, all the discussants who have um, congratulated uh, Dr. De Lacan on the publication of this uh, book that we are celebrating today. I also want to appreciate Professor Adelito and the LSA team for having me here again. Um, although I think I'm going to test you after now that when I sit on panels, I don't like presenting last <laughs> because it makes your job very arduous having the same to you know, other authorities dissect the, the work. Um, well, I I also struggled a bit uh, because one way or another, the hard copy sent to me couldn't get to me, so I had to read the book on, on my phone. I hope I'll be able to, to make a few points, and then when I am able to lay my hands, I will be able to strengthen and um, prepare here. Um, my first impression when I read the book, well, I I, I was I was amused, you know, because um, um, if you read Dr. Adelakon on the in the punch, and then you and then you you read this book, um, you see some sort of contrast, and for me, in, in many ways, it's a strength. It means that it's possible for her to. To be to be sympathetic as a scholar, and to also be very frank and brutal as a social commentator and a public uh, intellectual. So the first thing I noticed, like uh, Professor Adeko said, was that her um, uh, her interrogation of Pentecostalism in Nigeria um, came from that sympathetic point of view and attempt to, to make us understand, um, to see beyond um, the, the appearance that some people idolize and celebrate and that some people also criticize, you know, very, very, very <laughs> is that um, coming so soon after um, another work on Pentecostalism in Nigeria by um, Professor Ebenezer Abadari, um, one thing that I can say is that those who feel that our society is increasingly becoming more secularized and that religion is receding into either the private space or going into oblivion, 
are maybe they may be they may be very very mistaken wow so dr de engagement with performative spirituality situated with situated within nigeria's brand of pentecostalism started out by identifying very early shared features with american evangelism whose political implications i believe for 10 very serious lessons for a fragile multicultural state um, like Nigeria. And um, I wanted to see more of, you know, a comparison between the trend of Pentecostalism in Nigeria and what obtains in the United States, and as well as um, what political implications that could have in view of the fact that we see that American evangelism to a very large extent contributes to the culture of political dysfunction and um, you know polarization that we witness that we that we see in American politics today. So I was hoping that there could be a stretch beyond um those those comparisons that we had in order for us to be able to say, okay, so what are the possible consequences that could emanate from even the deliberate and conscious attempt by Pentecostal pastors in Nigeria, for instance, to cut their American counterparts, especially since the, uh, the, the increase in requirement attacks and all of that, where we now see people you know, cutting the Republican Party, cutting the cutting the American evangelical movement in order to position Nigerian Pentecostals as the Nigerian version. Um, yeah, so to speak. But nonetheless, I believe that um Dr. Dela did a very good job on explicating the idea of prayer, especially from the angle of Nigerian Pentecostals. Prayer here wielded as an apocalyptic device. Of course, to begin with, the idea of praying to an all-knowing, all-powerful, and merciful God. First mind, back to the theodic question that have agitated many philosophers of religion. Coastal um, prayer warriors oftentimes though, sidestep the need to address the seeming contradictions and find weapons in biblical verses that acknowledge the existence of principalities and powers in the darkest places of the earth. Of course, we know that the aim of science is to explain, predict, and control the material world. And so what prayer warriors do is to try and appropriate the goals of science, which is to explain, predict, and control Appropriating these ambitions into the realm of the spiritual, considered to be distinct from the physical world, but with a causal connection that enables mutual influence and um, possible, manipula um, possible manipulation. Now, in the first chapter of the book, she delved into prayer as an apocalyptic device that methodologically appropriates the scientific goals of explaining social realities and seeking to control them through the prayerful detonation of spiritual landmines as you may be buried by the individual's predetermined destiny. Because practically everyone is united by the presence of the forces of derailment in their lives, even the manner and timing of the encounter, even if the manner and timing of the wish a mass spiritual, a mass of spiritual warriors now have to confront perpetually extraterrestrial forces that embark on custom-made attacks for different individuals and lives. The apocalyptic nature of this unending cycle of conflict between forces creates a situation in which the Pentecostal church as an army, unavoidable forces of capitalist production by which the weapons of war are produced and consumed. Although the author justifies why the emergence of the MFM and his brand of fall down and die prayers captures the modus vivendi of this prayer movement with its graduated stages of war. 
it is not difficult to see how that spiritual economies, such spiritual economies have proliferated from printed resources to other inventions from the now many prayer military factories, ranging from the anointed oil to victory handkerchiefs, stickers, among other, you know, of, of warfare. Most notably, um, I note the author's sources in noting, even very briefly, that the Manichaean worldview in which the unseen collides with the material with very se severe implications for the unprepared emerged within the context of certain material and historical realities. It is very difficult to causally severe the emergence of Nigerian Pentecostal Christianity and its prosperity leading message from the political and economic context of political irresponsibility, military dictatorship, class targeted austerity, and social alienation that characterized the 80s and 90s. While the message of hope, individual grace, and flourishing provided comfort for many despairing citizens, the widening gap between the optimism of the pulpit and the worsening economic conditions created new divisions and new explanations had to be sought. I believe it is within this milieu that apocalyptic prayer emerged as the response as the discovery of very potent that if not and powers and their roles in the frustration of meaningful existence. More often than not, fabricated objects embody, um, embody an idea, worldview, or underpinning philosophy that provides valuable insight into the thinking. So the author's gaze shifted from prayer to the prayer warrior the wielder of the apocalyptic weapon of war. Here, the prayer warrior in his battlers and the wielder of prayer's weapon. And I think Professor Adel also thought about that metaphysical conundrum in which you are simultaneously the wielder of a weapon and a weapon in the hand of God, you know, himself. Whose wheels? Ah, and wars are enforced through the warrior as an active medium. The chapter also presents an interesting <laughs> contending that the fragmentation of the divine pool is less of an exasperating acknowledgement of its infinity in contrast to human's limited understanding and more of a short-termist approach to living, which prioritizes what works at the moment. My immediate impression is that the author's interpretation does not displace Waribopo's idea Rather, it complements and builds on it to explain the plurality of motivations that account for situational and limited explanation of God within a boundless framework that makes an infinitely diverse rendition of his nature possible. This way, God is able to be human based on projected parts or be anything else in nature the need of the prayer warrior. So God could be a dove, a huge ball of fire, a mighty wind, or an ageless rock. Also, the author's interpretation resonates deeply in that it speaks to the nature of modern consumerist culture fueled by the capitalist impulse of profit accumulation. And so because we live in an age where everybody wants to live life on the, life on the go, um, there, is, there is a resonance with the notion of interpreting God in the way in which God will fit your present need so that you just move on onto on to the next thing. Of course, when you encounter the next challenge Two minutes. of life, Two more minutes. To also invent God in another way in which you want to say. Yeah, another part of the book that I found very interesting is um, um, the interrogation of um, Pentecostalism in uh, reaction to, 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 to COVID in Nigeria. Um, I, I believe that um, the author did a very good job of, of, of presenting contrast, uh, reading to Neva Kari and um, Odukoya on one hand, and um, Oyedepo and Chris Oyalu Okiyakilome on the other hand, you know, pro provides a very balanced contrast of opinions. <laughs> and then the author deliberately left us to, 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 to make our conclusions. And I feel that is the point that has been made in terms of her not taking a very concrete position herself as to what ethical 
or epistemological implications all of this could have. Perhaps we were lucky that COVID-19 happened and Africa did not go through the disaster that many predicted. But what if that had happened? What could have been the implications of the position of the church in terms of trying to antagonize the states because of its own limited benefit? I believe that the, the author could have interrogated um, this a little bit more. Um, I, I, I'll conclude by also asking if the author um, considered the possibility that the violent nature of our prayers and the way and manner in which we want to fragment God to suit our needs immediately. Perhaps, are there ways in which they manifest in the ways in which we live our lives? So if you serve a God he, that in this particular fragmentation is a protocol breaker, <laughs> how does that translate, for instance, to so the way we behave when we get to filling stations, ATMs, when we find ourselves in traffic and all of that. I believe that um, it will be very, it will make for interesting research to find out how we transpose some of the things that we impose on God and how those things reflect in our lived um, realities and the implications they have for um, a society like ours, where sometimes these values, beliefs, and then, um, you know, um, worship systems can be conflicting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, uh, presentation and uh, uh, intervention. Well, we have, what do we have? We don't have a lot of minutes. I think we have like just a little bit. Yes. So. so we are going to give our uh, author uh, Dr. Didakun, the opportunity to respond, but there are so many issues raised. So obviously, I don't think she can even respond to half of them. So she will just do the best she can, maybe in the next uh, five or six minutes, and give a kind of general response in case we have people in the audience who want to ask questions or other or panelists who wants to follow up with uh, 10 seconds uh, statements. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. I I am really, really grateful to everyone from the chair of the panel to Dr. Or, um, every one of you, sorry, because I have only 10 minutes. And uh, the fact that you brought out all of this point shows that um, you really engaged my work and I really appreciate the amount of work that you put in. Thank you so much. And um, also going through this process has helped me to understand my book better. And I'm very grateful to you on that score. And so I will, I've tried to summarize all the questions into seven points, and I'll take them one minute each, hopefully. And um, to the question raised by first by Dr. Adiakwa and almost everybody is the question of my closeness to the subject. And I take the fact that you're bringing it up as some kind of commendation, because when I started this work, access was a serious issue for me. You know, one day I can do another kind of work on accessing spaces in Pentecostal communities. The kinds of scrutinies that I face for my beliefs, my politics, my appearance, everything, right? Like, you know, so I wouldn't even call myself close to them, but for if, my, if it looks as if I was close to them, it means that I was able to overcome all the hurdles and be able to present a very close um, look at them. And also to Dr. Mito um, Dumoyi, that he said that Pentecostals are a complex movement, and I should have acknowledged that I agree with you. But trying to puzzle the complexities of what constitutes Pentecostalism would have been a completely book, a, a different book entirely. And then to the other point about um, leftist, politi leftist political practice that is not unlike prayer, my answer is yes. And my goal was to present prayer as an unlikely but very potent device through which Christian spiritual warriors achieve political goals. Now, it's different from the ways people have looked at prayer um, as rhetoric, as theology, and, you know, different ways. I'm trying to find, you know, to look at how prayer works in that sense. And um, to Dr. Diakot's point that um, um, what the fighting prayer makes present, you said the only thing a fighting prayer can verifiably and assuredly make present 
without any additional analysis is the prayer and um, the performance to wish to test their efficacy. One will have to step around the warriors themselves. But I note that part of the efficacy is, is the political project that it fulfills or is taken to have fulfilled. You see, the, it's the performative aspect of prayer drives other kinds of political purposes, such as when people combat for spiritual and political capital. And that's another reason that my framework settled on devices, because I want people to think of the contrivances, that the process is contrived, you know, it's artificial in that sense, it's machinated. And you also ask, what of performance? Doesn't fake imply false, untrue, and inauthentic? I say yes, yes, yes. But performance also implies strategies of improvising, devising, creating, making things up, inventing, composing, fabulating, fabricating. And those are the ways I want people to look at the work, right? I have, you know, how in the process of um, you know, spirituality, people make things a lot. I want them to think of it as very inventive process, as very creative in itself. Premise the spiritual over uh, the political, and it's not really radical. But then again, what is spiritual except politics by other means, right? If you ask people that are, you know, that I work with about whether they should focus more on the political than, you know, their spiritual exercises, they tell you that how do you know that it's not because of God that things are working like this, that things are not, we are here because of God. You, I don't see myself arguing with that, right? Because it is a way of understanding their world. It is a mode of understanding how reality functions. When Nigerians say that the spiritual determines reality, they are pointing us towards their understanding of how reality is shaped and how it needs to be understood in order to reshape it. So it's it's not like they, they, they don't think of the world as spiritual and political on two different sides. They think of both as working together. And the kind of politics that needs to change it has to go to that source. You know, to be able to make the kind of political changes they want to see. But again, I understand why this question was for persistent presentation. I think there is some argument to be made about, you know, like functionalism of religion and the, the ideas like that. But we're dealing with people that think of their um, religion in those very specific ways. And then there are really crucial points that Dr. Diaco brings up about them, Dr. Donald Trump and Dr. Stella Emanuel, and um, how much of their beliefs that are interrogated. I think Dr. Aikon also point to that, that the academic part of me is different from the other part of me. I agree, guilty as charged. But um, partly one of the reasons I didn't bother to talk about some of the details of Nigerian politics is because I have done aspect of Trump and racism in previous work, and I didn't want to you know, repeat that. And also about how Nigerian politics of ethnicity, regions, all of those, you know, how they work together in Nigerian Pentecostalism. So there was no point bringing, it, bringing them up again, uh, partly because my agenda in this work was to look at the rationale behind the beliefs, you know, why it manifests the way it does, and why partisan ideologies and certain behaviors latch onto the sacred rites of prayers. How compatible is racism and prayers, you know, how, why it, could, it can go together, you know, the partisanship that makes this, that, that, that um, close these gaps. And again, to say that um, not being judgmental, while it's a strength, is also a weakness. Again, I, I say I am as guilty as charged that I took no magisterial stance whatsoever. And that is part of the ways the performance methodology itself works. Yours as the researcher is to let the reader see and trust the judgment of the reader that they know how to ask the right questions and how to understand this. Right, I deliberately distanced myself because it's also a subject matter that developed in the context of the COVID and where people were being ridiculed for these beliefs. Right, there was no point for me to keep, you know, to go and start to make certain kind of evaluations of their belief system, but to ask, you know, to present it and let people understand where it's coming from. I think Dr. Idumoye's point speaks to this approach, you know, very cogently. And then to the point about Dr. Lukoyas and their scientism, their fascination with scientism. And uh, Dr. Shinulu also bring that up. I think um, the kind of binary thinking about, you know, do they, um, about, you know, um, engineering codes versus spiritual codes. That's part of what I hope the book will challenge. 
the idea that they they don't necessarily treat spiritual laws as superior to scientific laws when you really look at them closely it's not all it's not that simple you know i think dr lukoya made that point when he criticized his fellow pastors for their politics during the pandemic i asked him about it and he says because they don't know science it takes great uh, pride in the fact that he is a scientist as much yeah. as he's a geologist. Yeah. Doc, dr adelaku Yes. Uh, please, before, because we have three minutes <clears throat> before you round up. Okay. Yeah. Now, we, we have note that we have one or two people in the audience who want to ask questions. So I okay. want them to ask those questions and then you can round up. So okay. no uh, the people, I don't have access to the audience. So even the audience, please, you have questions. Let's take maybe just two questions. Uh, yeah, okay. Ask the question. Okay, so my next to me, uh, I want to ask the author why she's not to be all evangelists or evangelicals. You know, she didn't look at, uh, you know, some of these Pentecostalists from Southeast, maybe South South and other parts of Nigeria. Again, I also want to ask if she considers this Pentecostalism as a question of uh, masculinity, because uh, most of these, uh, like Olukoya, most of them are males. You know, can you do you do you you know think of them as in terms of uh, masculinity and then uh, towards gender? Is there a way you can frame it to look at these things? you know, looking at a question of power from the perspective of masculinity. Does okay, it? Thank you. Okay, so let me... Yeah. Yes. Okay. Do we have another question? Okay, yes, sir. Um, my name is Samuel um, from African Studies in the University of Paris. But soon to um, undo this work for just um, some minutes, uh, some minutes from... Um, um, a doctor um, whose work is on um, Omiyoke, Samuel Jose in West of Ibada. Mm -hmm. So I read the part, and then um, I, I, I don't know where, because looking at the politics side, there's a concept that you talked about, but I want to focus on the music part, because there's a way where music is transposed to prayer, and prayer is modulated to music. In the context of, in the Pentecostalism, you hear they were singing, it would say, Soda Dra. And from Soda Dra, it says Soda Ring. And then because you mentioned politics, when they are singing that song that looks like a prayer song, you will see them, um, although it's theatrics, but I want to look at the politics side where they are clapping and they are singing and they are making their voice louder than their partner or their, the other person. And then um, sometimes uh, after the song, they will now say something like, if you can shout, amen. Your prayer will come. So the policies or the power play that come where we are singing, and then uh, you want to overshadow the other person because you know that by overshadowing the other person, um, your blessing will come from there. So I, I, the policies side there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we give uh, Dr. Adela Kun the opportunity to round up now. Okay, thank you. So let me just quickly round up with just a few points. The fact that um, one is the point that I was making earlier that um, relationship of faith to science is this level. It's a lot of it is about appropriation. You know, science features through the appropriation of its mythologies is very superficial aspects in ways they use it to supplement and legitimize spiritual laws. And I will also say that they also try to use their fingers on the scale of science to tip it in their favor. And that is where they run into gravity. And I agree with Dr. Um, I, I did in that sense. And um, okay, so to the question that came about Pentecostals from other parts of Nigeria, I agree that I, you know, that Pentecostalism needs to move beyond Southwest Nigeria. And that is one thing that I have not done, but I know people who are doing that now. And so you will be seeing those kinds of work in years to come. As for power and gender, I quite agree with you. And I should let you know that Dr. Idumwe just did a book on Pentecostalism and gender. So I believe that will answer some of those questions. And as for music and prayers and all those embodied practices, there is a chapter in the book, chapter two, you know, that talks a lot about that, um, about sound and 
prayer. So that might also answer it. And then the question of fine, these are last questions. Uh, first is the question of violence. And that's a really, really co uh, complex idea, which um, I won't be able to elaborate on. But it's true that there's some idea of violence that on the, um, that, um, on the rights of, um, that in our society that impacts the ways people pray, right? And there is a lot to be said about, you know, power, sovereignty, and who can legitimately do violence that you that goes into the ways these kinds of prayers are prayed and understanding of violence in itself. But that's a really complex argument that I cannot really put here. And then the final thing is that several people have talked about the connections between Nigerian churches and the American churches. And I have to say that the resonances notwithstanding, the Nigerian Pentecostal movement is not a, a version of the American Pentecostal or evangelical movement. These are different movements. These are different set of practices, but they have places where they converge, right? And their convergence have, there is, has a long historical um, you know, component to it, but still doesn't mean that we just meet each other. Yes, we have, places, you know, we live in this very globalized world where politics and ideas and feelings can converge, but there are two different kinds of movements and that also needs to be acknowledged. Finally, I have to thank everyone once again, you know, all the panelists, thank you for the great work. I really deeply appreciate your perspectives on the book. And some of these points that you brought up, I honestly would put them in mind, you know, in subsequent work, especially the question of identifying myself within the movement. I try as much as possible to keep myself away, but you brought me out again. So thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for engaging the book and taking the time. Uh, sorry that our time was uh, a little out on us. But uh, I think we have enjoyed this. If they have given us five hours, we will still be here today. So it shows the book has achieved its purpose in actually provoking responses and contributing to our understanding of this very important movement. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Bye.